And, and we're moving into the whole idea of uh, something that you and I have, have very briefly discussed. Uh, PBLOs are, are described and will be created by students. So PBLOs are referring to problem-based learning objects. Mm -hmm. They'll be created by students in this course, um, and they make use of multimedia case studies, so video case studies. How do you yeah. use, view the use of video in the creation of your scenarios to be addressed by, in, in PBLO or PBL? You have talked to a large extent about the make use of uh, scenarios that are scripted ahead of time. Do you see these as being the same as uh, multimedia case studies? Are there differences? Um, I, I just want to explore this whole area a little bit. Yeah, I think, I think, you know, and as I've mentioned to you, Roland, I think this is an excellent question, and, you know, it's a topic that I'm very interested, very deeply interested in. Um, so my, you know, I'll start off by saying initially my view was, you know, I was, when I was looking at virtual, I'm looking at very high fidelity, you know, or I, I, I think, you know, I was in the train of thought where, you know, high fidelity virtual environments, that's all you need. Um, and I thought, you know, there was no need, no need for, you know, outdated video-based technology you know, within these simulate, you know, within these environments. But I have to admit, I've, I've taken a, I've done a 180 on that, and I think they, not only do they have their place, but they're actually, or they could be very effective. And I'll give you, an, you know, the, the knee replacement series game actually changed my mind on that, because we did incorporate, you know, we have these very high fidelity graphics, visuals that we, that, that we've developed, but we actually do incorporate actual surgical footage yeah, uh, so we actually do incorporate, you know, video which uh, of actual surgical footage which within these serious games, um, and from the from the uh, the users of the game, that was actually found to be quite effective. Um, and now I I don't know if this is you know you know based on experience, perhaps somebody who's very you know you're looking at surgical residents, they have you know they've obviously. You know, you know, have have knowledge in the field and, and what have you. They're not novice, in other words. So I don't, you know, I, I'd like to investigate that. You know, whether the there is any difference between novice and you know more more advanced uh, users and the use of multimedia. Uh, so that 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 was found to be quite effective, and we had some really good comments when we conducted our study with that. And just informally, many of the uh, the people that I've spoken to who who I'd actually you know who I demo this work to they're they're really fond of the videos. Um, and in a, in addition, I'm also using some videos in another study that I'm doing with again with some colleagues at uh, Sick Kids, where we're actually using videos. We videotape again. This is medical based procedures. We we videotape students and experts alike. Uh, performing certain procedures, and we put them online, and we have students. Um, go in, log in, and they're able to critique these videos. They can critique their own, and they can critique others. And of, of course, others can critique, you know, and vice versa. Um, and this has also been found to be quite effective. Um, and we also have experts log in who also go in and critique the students, uh, the, 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 the students' videos, and, and in particular, the performance, their, their performance on the task shown in the video. So again, we're hearing very good feedback on that, and that has that has proven to be quite effective. So my view on on the use of multimedia and and video, I think is, I think they're great. Actually, I think it's I think it's a great idea, and I think it's it's an it's an additional tool that we have in this you know repertoire of tool of tools that we you know we can use to you know in learning in education in general. Um, do you have any rationale or explanations for why you think um, the use of video might be um, as effective or even perhaps more effective than the use of uh, you, the graphics that you were uh, designing ahead of time? Well, I, I, you know, I'm, I'm, trying to, I'm trying to really figure that out, but I think um, with the graphics, I'm, I mean, we're, we're by no means, we, we don't have, you know, our graphics and our ability to recreate reality in, in the, the virtual domain, um, you know, it's not perfect. So we, we can definitely, we, we, you know, yes, we can do a lot with it, but there's some things we just can't do graphically. Um, and I think with video, you know, there's a number of things here. I think with video, you, you could potentially capture these little nuances that perhaps you can't cover in, in, um, in, a, in the virtual world. And, you know, for example, facial expressions. Those are very hard to, to recreate faithfully in the virtual world. I mean, there's, you know, we can't do that perfectly. Um, yet, with a video, we're able to do that faithfully. Um, similarly, with you know, when you're looking at in, you know in a medical um, in the medical domain, 
you know, very little little subtleties. It could be the way the, the you know, you could have a patient that has a blanket over them and the blanket itself, trying to model blanket as it falls over a body, again, in the virtual world, that's very difficult. But when you have a video, you're able to capture that. So I suspect that that will be, that is something, the fact that you, that has something to do with it, the fact that you do have these, you know, detail that you can perhaps not necessarily convey in the virtual world. Um, similarly, in the virtual world, if you can't, there may be the case, or it could be the case, that if you cannot convey these little subtleties, it could totally break your sense of immersion, and you can completely realize, or, or you may just have that moment where you say, this is not real, and then it all falls apart. Um, that's another interesting area of research that I'm very much interested in, and actually looking, looking towards that. I mean, how much reality do you really need? Um, so I, th I think the... the I think that has a lot to do with the videos being effective. And I also think, um, just in general, and not so much you know, the virtual, related to the virtual domain here, I think it's, it's quite interesting, I think, to just be able to, being able to log in and critique someone else's work in a, in, a, in, a, in a constructive manner, of course, and compare it to your own at the same time. Yeah, the, the, the peer uh, critique is uh, a tool that we use quite frequently in, in, um, in education context that anyway so uh, I agree with you what we've talked about in this course is it, exactly that you know try to recreate some kind of context or situation within which um, the user the viewer can actually find themselves so they can identify with it in some way shape or form and as a result of them being able to identify with the situation um, you're, you're calling it the storyline I, I would suggest that there's more to it than just storyline because uh, what I've done is taken um, a series of, of uh, video clips and then removed the storyline because I look at it thematically. So I grab a bunch of clips that are related to each other because of the theme so that the storyline becomes the theme rather than a continuous kind of uh, sequential piece that we usually talk about as a story. Yeah, yeah. Interesting. Um, so it, it 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 plays games with people's minds as well as you're going through. They're looking for the story and they can't find it, so they start looking for other things as a result. Um, any further comments about um, you know elements that might have um, that ring true with individuals? Um, I think I think past I, and and perhaps this is not what you're specifically looking for but I think also past experience and how much you know how not you know how much if any knowledge they've had in the past that may well I guess that's I, I guess that's probably education in general um, but I think that may come into play as well um, as far as anything else um, off the top of my head I can't think of anything else <laughs> Okay, let, let's just very briefly move into the, the back end of, of this. So um, can you give a little bit of, um, I, I don't want to go too far down this road, but uh, a little bit of technical details. What kinds of platforms are you working with um, when you're developing these serious games? Um, where do you put the emphasis um, as, as you're moving forward through these pieces, uh, et cetera? Yeah, that, that's, that's an interesting question. Um, so. I mean, it, it, it all depends. It depends on the, you know, they have to be, so these, these games have to be designed and I should say thought out, well, designed very carefully. And there should be a good emphasis placed on the design, which a lot of times that's not the case. Um, and I find myself doing that sometimes as well. You're kind of rushing to get this thing out and you start coding and you put things together without really thinking about what it is you're actually doing. So really, this this really has to come. There is a there is a very, and I think this is the key here. Not so much the the technology itself or, or building these things is is not not all that difficult. It just takes time and money. Um, but in terms of, I think it, it it's very important that you know this is where you know again an interdisciplinary approach comes into play. So you have education experts, you have the technical experts. And also the content experts, of course, because the serious game itself, you know, it's pretty well useless if there's no content that drives it. So in other words, it's, it's, it's only as effective as the content that drives it. So really, in terms of the going back to a problem-based learning approach, 
you know, game development itself does employ a problem-based learning. It, it is inherently a problem-based learning approach. Um, so you have groups of people coming together, each, or, you know, interdisciplinary um, group of, you know, folks coming together, each with their own specialty, and they come together, and you have a problem. And the problem has to be well thought out, again, in a, you know, similar to a PBL approach, where what is it, what is it specifically that we want to accomplish with this game? Who's our target audience? These are just some of the questions. But you really have to map that out um, because that really drives the development and the types of graphics, the types of interactions we're going to employ. Um, you know, are these novice learners? Are they advanced? Are they intermediate? All that has some it has some say in, or, or will drive the underlying technology. And it's in particular, you know, again, what type of interactions, the type of graphics, and, and, and what have you. Um, so really, that has to you know, it is, it is a very team effort. You come together, you map out the problem, and then you set out your design. And then what you do is, you know, obviously we're, you know, looking at this from a research perspective. We have limited funding. So what we then try to do is uh, rig up a prototype. And the prototype, we usually do it with, you know, available tools, uh, typically free. Uh, there's a Unity engine, which is our um, you know, a, a game development engine which gives you, does a lot of the, the grunt work for you, a lot of the graphics rendering and, and things like that. It actually does that for you. So you're able to very quickly put together a prototype and, you know, with an educational license, it doesn't cost anything aside from the, the students that are uh, programming this. Um, and you're able to create a prototype and then the prototype, you conduct focus group testing. Um, you learn about the interface. You, you, you find out, you know, focus group testing is done with Technical experts, as you know, even even students as well, um, technical based students, um, as well as the you know, in, in the in the medical domain, you use medical professionals. I mean, they give you really good feedback on you know what they think of the interface, let alone the content. So once you have the focus group testing done, then you proceed. You you refine your you know your your game. Perhaps you refine some of the models to some degree, depending on what the focus group testing. Um, I um, mean, then you go in and you, you know, run your, your user study. But as far as the development, there are, there are many tools out there that, that we can use, you know, uh, you, you know from a research perspective that, that are fairly, fairly, you know, does, they don't cost a lot of money. And it really is just the, the time and the effort required on the people that are involved. So the tools themselves are, you know, for, for, for research purposes and educational purposes, there's a lot of good high-level tools out there that, that let you you know, rig up a prototype very quickly. Now, if you're looking at, you know, creating a, a product out of it, then the, the model changes. Obviously, there's a lot more um, costs and, and, you know, associated with that. We're also looking at some of my own work has developed or is developing um, a serious game engine or a serious game platform. So we have this base platform, which takes care of a lot of the, you know, we're, we're, we're actually in the process of designing this and, and building it at the same time. Um, but we're looking at what is common throughout, you know, we're only looking at it from a surgical perspective and in particular the, the cognitive aspects of surgery training. And we're looking at what is common throughout, you know, learning a task. And I, I guess it doesn't have to be specific to surgery. And we're building that into our framework. And then on top of the framework, we're able to take these domain-specific modules that we plug in and reuse a lot of the work that we've already done, and it cuts production time considerably. Sounds absolutely fascinating. Um, I think we're going to um, stop at this point. Uh, thank you very much for your time. Um, you're making yourself available and your willingness to share about your work and uh, the interplay between uh, your, your research area and uh, problem-based learning.